You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Magic 30th Edition has sent us to Conspiracy Town to find the real story behind Thousand Dollar Boosters. Plus, Brothers War previews, BNR called shots, and the latest technology in Modern and Pioneer. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, making my dramatic emotional return from my two-week sojourn to jolly old England. And I am joined today by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is coming to us from the Middle East. He is bringing peace in the Middle East, we hope, <laughs> someday. He is Dan Shriver. Dan, what's going on? Oh, it's good to hear your voice again, sir. We missed you, David. We missed you. Yeah, I didn't miss you guys. I was uh, wandering in the wilds of uh, England, trying to make sure that country didn't fall apart without a queen and or a prime minister for a short time. You didn't miss us at all? No, I did not. Seven days of scenic walking, you must have caught up on so many podcasts. Oh, I didn't uh, have a single uh, audio thing other than just listening to the uh, breeze and the birds and the occasional other walker. That's so beautiful. It was awesome. I'm jealous. Nothing to do but get your uh, 16 miles in, so might as well uh, huss if you want to eat lunch and dinner while the sun's still out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds rejuvenating. Really glad to hear that. Glad to have you back. We got a lot of magic news to talk about, so you've come at just the right time to help us sort through all this. Yeah, we got 17 different sets being released, <laughs> various... <laughs> electronic products being pushed i think we'll even have some time to talk about like a couple decks but i don't know i've got like a bunch of rants here earmarked i know you have some special rants too so it's funny so much of magic is not about playing magic anymore <laughs> no no <laughs> that, uh... no absolutely like i was preparing for this episode and i was going through all the stuff and like thinking of all my grievances and then i'm like oh that's right i should actually test that deck we talked about <laughs> That, that is right. <laughs> Let me go ahead and play that league. And yeah, that was maybe the least satisfying part of the whole experience. <laughs> well, before we get into our uh, old men yellow cloud phase of the podcast, we need to take care of a little housekeeping at the top here. So first of all, we want to give a big shout out and welcome to our newest patrons. They are Colleen G and Ryan G. So thank you to both of those individuals. You know, welcome aboard. We really appreciate every patron. Just a reminder that if you enjoy the show and you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Join at whatever level you feel is comfortable for you. And you get a chance to support the show. You get access to our Discord. And you get a bunch of other fun perks. Yeah, absolutely. Every contribution makes a big difference to us. Just helps us keep going. And we'd love to have you in the Faithless family. The Discord's a wonderful place, a source of comfort in these troubled times. <laughs> yeah, so the Discord has got a bunch of crazy ideas floating around in it. We have, of course, there'll be lots of arguing about if cards are good or bad uh, during spoiler season. And once one or side or the other is proved wrong, of course, we won't ever bring up that we <laughs> felt that way about a card ever again. It's the, uh, the age-old cycle. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's like a crypt where our secrets go to be sealed away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you want to come learn them, <laughs> come, come check it out yourself. So what's going on in the world of magic? Well, David, you've been away, so I don't know how closely you've been following all this, but we've got a bunch of stuff going on. We got our first look at the Brothers War, hashtag MTG Bro. Got about eight new cards. I think we've actually talked about all of them before. In our most recent episode, Emmy had our good friend Anthony Menino, a.k.a. I Play Bad Decks, 
filling in, and I think they covered the two latest previews. That's Mishra and Mishra's meld partner, soulmate, the Phyrexian Dragon Engine. They had a nice discussion there, but I'm curious, David, if any of these cards, whether the, the new Dragon Engine or Urza or anything else, stood out to you? Anything you want to add about them? Well, you know, we as a podcast have a strange affinity for a card that you can cast out of your graveyard for red, red, and discard your hand and draw three. <laughs> so I think more than any, we're probably more excited, and I, when I say we, I mean you, to have this Dragon Engine around as, as a card value card, right? It not Three mana, two, two, double strike, we know is not playable. There's been, I don't know, six or seven white variants of it with minor upsides, uh, and they've basically seen very little play. I guess the pro green, pro black double striker was sometimes a sideboard card against Jund uh, when Jund was a thing that you wanted to sideboard against. I mean, I played it as a sideboard card against Jund, I'll say. Um, so we know that isn't playable, right? Um, there's no three mana, two, two double striker in Pioneer that sees any play. So, um, but it is colorless, so it's easy to cast. It is an artifact and it does have this clause and you can bring it back with an unearth. Uh, you can bring it back with Goblin Engineer. These are ways where this is almost like a, um, a middle age pyromancer <laughs> type of effect. Whether mm. you'd want to combine it with Mishra, which I don't think is particularly playable or not, is your business, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. And I think I agree. Mishra just doesn't do enough. And you have to be attacking with both Mishra and the Dragon Engine in order to flip them and then... Even then, you know, that just gets Leyline Binding, so I'm not totally convinced that that wins the game to meld them. Well, I, th I think if you meld them, you're going to win 99% of those games, but the, it's, it's having to attack with both is, makes it so unlikely to happen. But let's just focus on the Dragon Engine itself for a second. You know I love Ox of Agonis. Yes, that's what I was referencing, of course. <laughs> Before Ox of Agonis, I loved Bedlam Reveler. I love anything that discards your hand and draws three cards. What about this Dragon Engine? Like, how many can I put in my deck? This is the question. So the interaction with Goblin Engineer is a good one. That's modern only, obviously. It works perfectly, right? You can just have one Dragon Engine in your deck, tutor it up, and you can then either unearth it for five, or you can just activate the Engineer's ability because it has a low enough CMC for that. But can I put like three or four Dragon Engines into my deck? In your modern deck? I, I don't think so. I think of this as a tutor target for Goblin Engineer that you just like cycle, you know, whatever your other artifact that's lying around, you know, you sack mm -hmm. your um, synthesizer, you put this in play, you draw three cards, the synthesizer excels another card, your opponent's just like, Jesus Christ, that was literally better than Ancestral Recall. Like, how it, you just do it again next turn? It's just crazy. Um, but I just think the front side is so bad. Um, you know, you have a note here, Dan, I just want to ask you about it, that it does not work with Emery or Breach. Is that because you're actually casting them? Or so it's entering from the stack or? Yeah, that is why. So there were a couple interactions people were excited about. One was with Engineer and the other was with Emery, Lurker of the Luck. But it turns out that Emery casts the card from the graveyard and therefore it actually goes from the graveyard to the stack and from the stack to the battlefield. So it didn't actually fulfill the condition of entering from the graveyard. Mm, interesting. Which is the same reason that, like, Prize the Malcolm has that weird text about if it was cast from the graveyard or if it entered from the graveyard. Because technically, casting a Gravecrawler from the graveyard does not cause a Gravecrawler to enter from the graveyard. Got it. So is it, is it it's the case then, then, like, Phyrexian Dragon Engine doesn't work with God Pharaoh's Gift because the token is just created by the God Pharaoh's Gift after it exiles a creature from the graveyard? Oh, yeah, yeah. That would also okay. be the case. Because that was, that was one thing I was thinking. That, that's an interesting would have been were that interaction more reasonable because a 4-4 double striker is actually quite good with haste uh, and then drawing three cards and discarding your hand is actually quite positive because it puts more creatures in the graveyard but it, it doesn't actually do that mm. but yeah i think this is the card i'm most excited about from what we've seen so far what about the rest of them david anything jump out at you i mean i love cost reduction i think urza is really cool i mean it's something worth trying i don't think it's good enough i do again just to get back to the dragon engine in pioneer I don't hate the Dragon Engine in a super artifact heavy deck that's like blue red that plays um, the the two blue blue uh, planeswalker that can make anything a base power four or any artifact a base power four. 
and then it pluses to draw two and discard two. But if you discard an artifact, you oh, Tezzeret, betrayer yeah. of flesh. Like I, I again, I, I think that card is really powerful. I think it's probably the most powerful card that doesn't see any play at all. Uh, I, I think it is just if you build your deck correctly, it's a four mana planeswalker that its plus ability is just much better than any other four mana planeswalker in the format. Um, but it's just like about support and this card interacts with it interestingly to me it's a card you can discard early on it's a card that really does well to absorb the the minus from uh, Tezzeret now here's a question for you does the static text of Tezzeret so that reduces your first activated ability by two does that apply to unearth (laughs) you're much more knowledgeable about rules than mine I don't think it does but I, I, you know, I am always surprised by. I didn't know the Emery Breach thing. That's why I'm asking you. You're, you're the guru, the rules guru on the on the podcast. I suspect that it does because I think if you look at the full Oracle text of Unearth, it does have a colon. So it is like three red red colon, and then that makes it count as an activated ability from an artifact source. Okay, that's even more exciting, honestly. Um... Yeah, I, I just like the idea of like you play the, the two man artifact that gets a plus one plus one every time you play an artifact. You play Dragon Engine. You can play obviously the, the blue man artifact that you can tap a creature artifact mm-hmm. to ramp with. You play Tezzeret. You're like playing a mid range list. You're also playing a list that just turns a corner really quick. If you imagine like all of a sudden you're attacking with a 4 4 double strike Dragon Engine, I mean, it's just a crazy amount of damage. If it's reducing its ability to come back from the graveyard and attack that turn, and then you can make the new one into a 4 4 that turn. So you're saying like three mana, draw three make a 4-4 four, four double strike haste if, if that's how it works. I mean, there, there's something possibly there. Um, so I, I'm interested in that. Uh, you know, Mishra, I thought Shieldred was going to be a lot worse than it is. It's, it's you know, playable at least. Mishra kind of has a similar type of effect where it kind of is like a draw two, drain two if you build your deck correctly, which is sort of what Shieldred is if it lives a full turn cycle. I do think Mishra works well with uh, Fable, where you're kind of attacking with that 2-2 into your opponent's creature anyway, so you get like a free drain if you have a uh, a push. The cost reduction on Urza is interesting, but and the 4-toughness means, you know, at least it could see some play. I think that the Queen is really powerful it's, as like a build around, where you, you know, can possibly tap 4 mana in her and get 6 mana back and go up cards, which is insane. Yeah, the the ceiling on that activation, right? Queen Caleb and Krug. Wow, that's so powerful. But in general, I think all these could see some play. You know, Surge Engine. I don't know if it's good in Pioneer. I like that it taps to Urza in Modern to like do the first trigger <laughs> on itself. <laughs> you know, I kind of I kind of thought Mord was joking about this, but he mentioned the Grand Architect interaction, and now I'm I can't get that out of yeah. my head now. Like, of course, Grand Architect and Urza. I mean. Grand Architect makes it blue. <laughs> yeah, you can skip ahead directly to the Ancestral Recall mode Yeah, if you need to. And then Recruitment, you know, Officer, I think it's just really playable. The Some of the one-drops that the white decks are playing are not very good. The fact that it starts as a 2-1 and then turns into a card advantage engine in the, in the middle late game and hu- white humans is, like, everywhere. It's, it's become, like, a very disruptive deck. It's quite good against Mono Green. Um, yeah, I just think all these cards are at least tryable, but I'd probably... Recruitment officer will see the most play. <laughs> oh. Uh, the, the uncommon. <laughs> That's a bit sad. <laughs> but I think in modern, you know, I think Dragon Engine will see play at least a, a people try it out as a tutor target. But I'm excited to, like, build a deck around it and, um, and Tezzeret. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think we'll be definitely spending more time with that card. All right. Other news. Magic is turning 30 years old. What does that mean? Well, a whole bunch of stuff is happening, and they keep announcing it. I keep thinking, oh, okay, so that's the Magic 30 celebration, but there's more. There's always more. So now we're getting a full lineup of promos and products, and the biggest one is something called 30th Anniversary Edition. (laughs) I just... Sorry. I have to keep a straight face while describing this product. So it's four booster packs for $9.99. Plus tax, that is $999 for four booster packs of 15 cards each. What will you find in these booster packs? You will find, well, if you're familiar with Magic Online, you'll know that they've reprinted all the old vintage stuff in the modern card frames over the years, and it looks kind of weird, kind of tacky, kind of looks like someone made a bad proxy of a Black Lotus. 
So you can now open that in a pack. On the back of the card, you'll find a commemorative frame. It's not the proper magic back. It's another kind of ugly-ish picture of a black lotus. It says Magic 30th on the back. So these are not tournament legal, but they are official. So you can have a chance to open your very own Mox or Underground Sea or Life Lace or whatever you want for just $9.99. Yeah, all right. I'm going to zag here. I am stunned by how mad people are about this product. <laughs> the thing is, Wizards has been doing a lot of money grabs. And again, Hasbro is a corporation. They have quarterly targets for profit that they're trying to hit. This is the first money grab that they've made where if you want to keep playing competitive magic at the highest level in any format, doesn't matter what your favorite format is, you don't have to buy this product. That statement I'm making is a fact. If you want to keep playing the best cards in Commander, you want to keep playing the best cards in Modern, you want to keep playing the best cards in Standard, you don't have to buy this product, correct? Yeah, that's true for a lot of their secret layers and promos and stuff. But, but here's the thing. Modern Masters 1 and 2 are huge money grabs. The cards are super expensive. They raise the price of the format. If you want to keep playing multiple formats at the highest level, you have to buy those products. You have to buy the boosters or you have to buy the Ragabands and the Solitudes or whatever cards are playable in Legacy. So those are actual money grabs that, in my opinion, ruin what formats ought to be and change all these things around. This is a money grab that just doesn't affect you. It's the easiest one in the world to ignore. I, I, I'm, I actually wish that all their money grabs were exactly like this product and nothing like the ones that people seem very okay with. So I'm stunned that people are just like, oh, Modern Masters 2 is great. I can't believe they priced this. It's like, I don't know who would pay $1,000 for four boosters, but it's not my, you know, I'm not here to yuck anybody else's yum. There's people with more money they know what to do with. I recommend finding a, a wife, but if you don't want to do that, we have the 30th anniversary edition. It's wild to me that people are so upset about this. It's, it's, I'm actually very surprised. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but here are a few of the things in play. One is that we care about magic. We don't like to see the game or magic or the brand or whatever you want to call it. We don't want to see wizards embarrass themselves. And this product is kind of embarrassing. Two, it's kind of predatory, like preying on our nostalgia, like just trying to directly monetize whatever you felt was special about you know, the origins of the game. Three, it's kind of like low effort. It's just so bald-faced. The brazenness of it, just, you're just, it's breathtaking. So I think people are just shocked. Like, I honestly thought it was a typo when they said 9.99. I thought they were going to come back <laughs> and explain that no, this is these because these are proxies. They're not real cards. <laughs> of course, it's like ten dollars a pack. Like no, no, it's a a thousand dollars for four booster packs. Four booster packs of proxies. Right. Like even if it was a thousand dollars for a box set, like the original collector's edition. I mean, whatever. People have been hashing this out for a while, so. I'm not breaking any new ground there, but I think that's what a lot of the reaction is about. Yeah, I mean, you said something very interesting in the beginning. You're like, oh man, I really love playing Magic. It's like, yes, I love playing Magic. It's one of my favorite things to do. That's why I take the time to make this podcast. <laughs> this is the first product where they've tried to soak people for money, and the Modern Masters ones are also dripping and exploiting nostalgia, by the way. All these cards that reference other cards and things like this. That doesn't require me to buy anything. It doesn't change any formats. If you like how modern mass, how modern is played right now, you don't. There won't be any new random cards that they didn't uh, vet out correctly. They're not altering Pioneer or Standard or or Legacy or Vintage or Popper. It's it's affecting no formats. This doesn't change how Magic is played at all. Um, so yeah, I think maybe people were hilariously under enraged uh, about all the other previous money grabs, and this is the one they choose to care about. It's I, I feel like people just don't even understand what they like about their own hobby. <laughs> I would highly recommend that no one purchase this product. <laughs> and then continue to play Magic in whatever format. If you're an EDH person, a lot of people love to play Commander. That's awesome. This doesn't charge you any extra money. All, your decks are not altered. You don't have to go buy a Ragavan. The EDH had already banned all the best cards in this for, in this uh, set anyway because they were so hard to get. <laughs> but Soul Ring is legal. I hear what you're saying. If I'm understanding you, you're saying this has no relation at all to tournament magic, competitive magic, etc. Let me try to make the case that actually it is related. In a roundabout okay. way, it is related. Let's do it. But to do that, I'm going to have to take you to a special place. 
that I call Conspiracy Town. Ooh. This is where I live. Conspiracy <laughs> Dan is here. He's, he's putting a tinfoil hat on people. You can't see it at home, but if you hear a crinkling. Conspiracy Town, population caved in. Welcome. Yeah. Come with me on a journey. I have two conspiracies. They actually contradict each other, so I'm not sure which one is correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> so are you in on it, maybe? <laughs> possibly, possibly. How deep does this go? The Pope is involved, we know. One of these is a lie, but okay. possibly both are a lie. Three truths and a lie, all right. Exactly. Conspiracy number one. Okay. So you're aware of the reserve list, the contradictions about it. Yes. And, you know, will they ever abolish it? Et cetera, et cetera. Does this product violate the reserve list? Well, technically, no, it's a loophole because the reserve list refers to tournament legal versions of the cards. My conspiracy is that, all right, Wizards decided ages ago, 10 years, 12 years, that this was their end game. They, they do eventually want to monetize Black Lotus. They need a loophole and they settled on this tournament legal loophole. But you can't just say in the year 2010, hey, buy a proxy Black Lotus for a thousand bucks, you have to you have to do some work first. You gotta lay the groundwork. First, you have to destroy tournament magic. You have to utterly dismantle the idea that there's anything competitive about magic, that there should be a pro tour, that there should be, you know, well-managed competitive formats with a robust OP system. So everything we've seen in the last five, seven, nine years, you know, the MPL, the arena debacles mismanaged ban lists, et cetera, et cetera. All of this has been part of like a long con to make tournament magic a joke. So that when the day finally came, when they released <laughs> okay. this proxy product, right? And they say, oh, by the way, it's not tournament legal. No one cares about that. Everyone's like, oh yeah, thank God that we've given up on tournament legality as the benchmark for cards. You know, the commander players are falling over themselves to say, oh yeah, you can play whatever you want. We accept the fake cards. And, you know, of course, they're talking about printing your own cards uh, or hiring a proxy artist, which is, you know, whatever. That's fine for them. But it's all, it's all connected. The people who are getting laughed at are the people who are saying, well, I don't like this product because I wanted a tournament legal tundra that I could buy or a tournament legal underground sea so that I can play my sanctioned legacy tournament and share my love of legacy with the broader community. Like, those people sound like an absolute fools right now. So in a roundabout way, I feel like when you're saying if you want to play Magic at the highest level, you know, ignore this product. But Wizards is saying the highest level of magic is FNM slash the commander table. And this is kind of the culmination of that. Do you follow me? Yeah, but what I'm, first of all, I'm not saying play magic at the highest level. I'm playing play magic in any format. <laughs> um, the, the, even the formats you're talking about, most people don't play them, right? That's people our age. There's very few people that play legacy or vintage. And those are the cards of interest in this set, right? So FNM is not concerning itself with vintage <laughs> that often. I'm guessing there are not a lot of FNM vintage uh, tournaments firing. No, but I mean, same for Legacy. And let me go any, let me let me just go farther, just so we're clear here. I own a full playset of every dual land from Revised, and I own multiple mocks in. I own tons of cards that are on the reserve list. So I am allegedly the person who should be concerned because I've got a huge financial interest in cards, right? That are quote unquote on paper worth lots of money and might be depreciated by this. So let's just put that out there as well. Well, no, I think almost everyone is in favor of abolishing the reserve list. There are very few who are, like, are concerned about, you know, what happens if we reprint tournament legal versions of the cards. But actually that leads nicely into my second conspiracy theory. So Okay. I hope it's better than the first <laughs> one. We try this one on for The size. first one didn't move me. <laughs> Conspiracy number two. Okay. Wizards does not intend to abolish the reserve lists, never will, and they're kind of sick of us asking for it. Okay, I like this so far. This is in line with actually how businesses think, so now we're actually starting from a reality here. So the purpose of this product is to make people realize what a foolish request it is, because they basically priced this product at you know the current price of collector's edition cards so like if a collector's edition duel is like eight nine hundred bucks the average number of packs you have to open to get magic 30 proxy duel is about 900 bucks they're basically saying like yes we'll reprint that style of product the reprints will do nothing to alleviate prices they will be priced the same or even more expensive than they currently are and what they're actually saying is that if someday we did abolish the reserve list you know, that wouldn't help you at all. We'll just sell you a Black Lotus for $20,000. Secretly, our Black Lotus coming in five years when they abolish the reserve list. 
will just be a chance to buy a tournament legal Black Lotus, you know, in borderless foil for like 25k. Yeah, that, yeah. That's not, that's not a conspiracy. <laughs> I, have a, I have a little notice for everybody. Wizards of the Coast is not some like genius people. These are people who like struggle to finish college. Here's what's happening at Wizards of the Coast. Here's what's <laughs> happening at Hasbro. They want to make money. Every quarter, there's a bunch of middle managers and every like six middle managers report to one director and four directors report to a senior director and six senior directors report to a VP and eight VPs report to a senior VP or whatever. That's how a corporate structure is. And every quarter, if the Excel sheet is red, those guys get yelled at and some get fired. And if it's black, everybody gets like a, a you know, basically a high five and they get their mistress gets a nicer apartment. That's all this is. So to think about the value and they've been plotting for years, it's like the VPs that started 10 years ago, they're all gone. They all retired. By the time you get to be a VP at Hasbro, you're, you're already older. All that they're trying to do is make money. So what they did is they started Arena which is straight up just treats players like whales. It's super predatory and people love it. All these young people love Arena and think it's ridiculous anyone would play Magic Online. And the main thing that Arena taught people was there's no collectible nature to this game. That's the big revelation for young people. There's no collectible nature to Arena. And once you see that, what you see is the following. People spend a ton of money to just stay on the grind or they leave Arena. Arena is actually losing players, even though it still continues to be a huge profit center. So into that, you have this, where you're still trying to take advantage of people who care about collectability. And that's people our age, <laughs> who you're talking about nostalgia. Most Magic players, since most Magic players have started in the last few years, don't have nostalgia for uh, opening, you know, regeneration and uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Uth did troll or whatever. They don't give a shit about any of that stuff. They, these cards are not well designed. So I, I think this is just classic wizards. They're just trying to see how far they can exploit the customer base. And there's, they were surprised, I think, by how easily people just accepted Arena just soaking them week after week. Uh, and now this is like another, like, okay, we're getting young players. And we're just rinsing them. We don't care about that. What about old players? They don't play arena. It's like, look at David and Dan. They're just these grumpy old farts. You know, they're talking about their favorite uh, Nirvana record from high school. Like what the hell can we soak them? And here's our chance to say, no, man, you can't. I'm not that interested in this product. I'm just not going to buy it. And luckily it doesn't affect any, any competitive or non-competitive format. At all. I just still get to play my exact commander deck. I don't have to buy any new cards to make it, you know, match up with my opponent's commander deck that they didn't gain any new technology. It's not like initiative or, you know, whatever nonsense fucking thing is in <laughs> some of this other stuff. It's, I actually think this is the most harmful way. It's just like, this is like a little test. Like, are you guys even stupider than we think? And we can just say, no, man, we're not that stupid. They're like, okay, next time we'll try something maybe that isn't quite as exploitative. So, regarding the second conspiracy theory, you broadly agree with like why they're pricing it this way. But are you saying that they're doing this and they are actually intending to someday abolish the reserve list? They have no long-term vision at all for what's happening. Eventually some, here's the thing. The one thing they don't want to do is get sued, which is what the reserve list would do. Now, whether the lawsuit would win or not, I certainly don't know enough about the legality of the uh, guarantee they've made to the, the customers. Uh, I've heard Matt Sperling, who is a lawyer, talk about it. You know, he thinks there's, a case one way or the other, I, I'm just simply not qualified. But there's no reason to risk it, right? It's like at work, they talk about they don't mind getting auditing as long as they can win, but why even <laughs> keep your books in such a way that you can be audited? There's no reason to do it now unless they need to press the emergency button. Uh, so I think this is just a chance for them to try to exploit customers. And if we let them do that, they'll make another product that is even more exploitative. But Arena was the test case. It's not a collectible, which is how these other, these other cards, you know, Wrath of God with a black border is worth whatever, 300 bucks or something. But you can still buy a Wrath of God, you know, with a white border that's whatever, 30 bucks. I, I don't know what they are. Why? That's just a collectability thing. Arena just soaks you for more money than that, but there's nothing collectible about it. It's just you got, you know, some account and a thing and then you can't, there's not even formats to play and et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is just a very cynical uh, gesture, I agree with your analysis of that. I think it's a very predatory gesture. I agree with your analysis of that. But I'm very thankful because I think this is very cynical and predatory, just like the other offerings, including Modern Horizons 1 and 2. 
and it's one that doesn't affect any formats because I loved modern and don't like it as much anymore because I felt like I was being exploited. This is the exploitation of, you know, it's like a lottery ticket, right? There's all this money out there. It's like, but you don't have to buy a lottery ticket. It's, it's pretty sweet when you don't buy a lottery ticket. Just take all the money you've earned and spend it on, you know, uh, a nice guy or gal that you're fond of and maybe have a nice meal. And Well, I hear what you're saying. You make some valid points, but I choose to believe both of my conspiracies. And I'll probably come up with a few more by next time. <laughs> the, self, the self-nullifying conspiracy theory. Exactly, exactly. I mean, how else can we explain the utter mismanagement, organized play in shambles, if not to bring us to this moment of selling us non-tournament well, legal cards? I would like to echo what I, so we can talk about how old we are. I'll t- say what I said to my friends in college about 9-11, all these crazy conspiracies. The easiest solution is just that George W. Bush is incompetent. That's the easiest solution, right, to all this. It's not that he planned with Halliburton and then they did this thing. It's like, this guy's just a dude who doesn't care very much about people and he's not very smart. It's much easier <laughs> to imagine Watsy as a giant, or excuse me, Hasbro as a giant corporation is, is, is sort of like a George W. Bush of uh, 2022 than to imagine it's, <laughs> you know, some kind of uh, Bilderberg <laughs> 12-year conspiracy. It's like, why would you hire Huey Jensen to try to fix organized play, one of the most widely respected, highly competent magic players in history, if you were, uh, weren't were serious about actually realizing you made mistakes? And where is Huey now, though? Has anyone heard from him? Do we, do we have proof of life of Huey Jensen? Has he been t- teleported into the Ukrainian front lines? We don't know. We need to hear from Huey. I, I want to see a, twice a picture if you're not being of held, Huey, Huey holding today's newspaper. <laughs> exactly. So I have not seen it. this man in a long time. We need Huey playing poker against the, uh, the gal who cheated <laughs> <laughs> to make sure he's up to date on uh, the latest technology. Or the chess player who cheated. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> cheating conspiracies everywhere. Magic somehow dodging them left and right because there's no competitive play to cheat in. All right, so that's Magic 30. I think that's enough about the $1,000 boosters. There's other stuff too. I mean, honestly, the rest of the promos look pretty cool like the, the other promotions are actually good so well just one last thing here dan you highlight this the the art is really terrible i don't know why the cards look bad that is lazy so i agree with that part of it they look horrible right yeah they look really bad like so one of the promos you can get next year is counterspell gorgeous old frame looks beautiful i think it's for dominaria remastered one of the you know we forgot about this set but it's coming <laughs> If you get a box of that, you get a beautiful <laughs> counterspell. And if you compare that to the counterspell from Magic 30, it just looks like, it looks terrible. Like the, the entire card image gallery is up for the Magic 30th thing. And I mean, if, if you want these cards, right click save is always an option, right? We learned something from NFTs. <laughs> Printed on good printing stock. <laughs> exactly. You can have them. You don't have to spend $999 no. for them. But they don't even look good, to be honest. Like they look, pretty bad yeah they do look bad it reminds me when they made like fourth edition and it was just like they just used less vivid colors than revised and if you had never played revised it would look fine right but because you have seen these beautiful cards and again i started playing when revised was out and that was something that really like hooked, hooked me in how beautiful the cards looked it was really stunning like oh it's weird they're just spending less money on this for no reason but of course that (laughs) <laughs> the the haunting uh, prophecy of that uh whatever 20 or 30 years later yeah um let's see any other quick hits post malone secret lair i'm gonna buy one of those for you david you know that's your, your favorite rapper <laughs> and yeah he's, he's one of the greats <laughs> transformers and the brothers were okay all right let's skip all that shall we how about a bnr bnr coming on monday this episode is coming out on monday so yeah you have a called shots, bold predictions. It feels like they're going to ban something in standard and it feels like they shouldn't, but it, I think they'll probably ban something in modern. Really? Hmm. Just because like shake it up. Why not? Well, and I feel like modern seems like it's the most played format. If you have information that, that tells me that's wrong, I'm, I'm happy to correct myself, but that's my understanding. Might as well. I mean, apart from Arena. Yeah. Um, and so I think the most played formats have the most people complaining and, um, I don't know what, what people would even ban out of modern. You know, I, I've heard people say Renin six. I, I feel like Omnath is a ridiculous ban. Expressive iteration, obviously very powerful card. 
Right now, the format, again, seems very internally balanced. I think I've always given credit to Modern Horizons 2 for sort of miraculously maintaining that status. Um, standard, I also think people complained a lot now that there are people are sort of adjusting. Yes, black is the most powerful color. Should one of the black cards be banned? I, you know, I won't claim that I've played or even watched enough standard to know, but people complain constantly about it, and I think that's really what they're responding to. I don't actually think they're making... Uh, analysis that's relevant to actual gameplay. I think they're just responding to people pissing and moaning. How about a Yorian ban in modern? Just because there's still time to right the wrongs of the past. Well, I mean, <laughs> at the risk of being pedantic, you know what my solution to these cards is. <laughs> Delete the lines that say <laughs> companion and then legalize them all. I mean, just companion should not exist. I, I, I just don't understand why we just, that's the right, right and the wrong. That's the original sin. Now is a chance to remedy that. I mean, I know Here someone's going to say, oh, the Yuri Index are only X percent of the meta. They're not that good. But like, who cares? Let's just admit it was a mistake. Roll it all back. Honestly, that's not enough anymore. I need the person who came up with that to get fired, to be terminated publicly, and to make sure that they're not allowed to work in Magic ever again. So ban banning Companion is not even enough anymore. I need that person terminated publicly. Terminated with extreme malice. And like shame, like tarred and feathered, and we walk behind with a bell that says shame as they like leave yeah. Seattle or wherever. I mean... Yeah, a spectacle. It's just so obviously bad. And, and when... <laughs> Sam Black told the story like I told them immediately not to do this and they were just like okay you're not coming in any more meetings it's like what, what are we doing here we're not gonna listen to Sam Black <laughs> well I think he was already locked in at that point like he was yeah. he was asking for more than he realized because it was not part of the set <laughs> that he was working on yeah pioneer I mean I'm looking at this article from Frank Karsten he's got a, a wonderful new column I think we mentioned this when it first started up, but it's great to see Frank Carson crunching some numbers on the mothership on wizards.com. Yeah, Frank, Frank Carson is awesome. So his article this week, or for October 6th, was all about Pioneer. You can see that Rakdos midrange is still the number one deck. It's got a pretty large share, 26% by Frank's calculations. Now he's got his own little metrics there, so that's not an exact number, but roughly like that's its share of the winner's meta. Is there an argument for, I don't know, Fable of the Mirror Breaker? Ban that from Pioneer. Say it's too much, giving you too much for one card, it's propping up these decks, making it unrealistic for other mid-range decks to compete. No, I, a ban in Pioneer would be ridiculous. And it's interesting, if people wanted to ban something out of Pioneer, I would ban something far different, like... The problem with Pioneer is not building a mid-range deck that can beat Rakdos, which is actually borderline trivial. It's building a mid-range deck that can beat Rakdos and compete with all the other decks. Uh, when you go down your list, you see all these super low to the ground aggro decks seem to have efficient removal. Rakdos gets to play Fatal Push. And then you see like Controlless, Rakdos gets to play Thoughtseize. Those are the cards you should be looking at if you want to balance it out. You could ban like Nykthos plus Fatal Push, for instance. Oh god. You're, you're serious about Fatal Push. Well, I'm saying if you actually want to get rid of the ability of red, Black X to be the best mid-range deck. Hmm. Fable's main job is to just filter away all the cards that don't matter in the matchups. That's the thing that it does. You get to play four of the most disruptive card against control, four of the best removal spell. You get to trigger Fatal Push because it makes a creature that makes a treasure. So your mana is nice, but you don't have to play any, any Fable Passage. And then it, it, it puts the other ones away, and then it makes sure you don't flood. So you could either ban Fable, which I, I would, is like a borderline laughable suggestion to me, and, or you could ban other stuff, or you could just leave it alone. Or you could ban Nykthos and see if not having to beat Mono Green allows other decks to... Because, I, I, I mean, my record against Rakdos is absolutely insane. Uh, if, that, if that was the only deck in the format, we, we would be the most successful podcast on, on planet Earth. I, I just build mid-range list after mid-range list that crushes Rakdos. It's the other list. Like, can you beat Rakdos and Spirits? The answer is no. I cannot do that. <laughs> I think you're underselling Fable. I think it's, it's more of a problem than you think it is. Not saying that it has to be banned, but it is like... To me, it's the most important card in that deck. I mean, 
let's say it is. Let's say it's by far the best card in the deck, and let's say Rakdos is the best deck in the format. It doesn't push any other decks out. I, I just don't understand why people, like... First of all, we were all going to ban uh, Treasure Cruise a while ago. We forgot about that. And then it was like, we need to ban something from, uh, you know, something from Grease Fang. And then we have to ban Nykthos. And now we're like back on here. And like, this just cycles through. Every There's been multiple weekends where there just hasn't been a Rakdos deck in the top eight. A Rakdos mid-range list. And yet, it's still the number one deck by a huge margin. Well, there has to be a number one deck. Hmm. Okay. A mid-range deck is the is the healthiest number one deck. That's an opinion I have. That's not a fact. Um, if I were going to make the case for banning a Fable, I would say it's kind of like an Oko class card. Like you have your Hogax and you have your Okos. <laughs> I know you think this is ridiculous. As a class, as a class, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Right. Like which is more dangerous? Well, the Hogak, you know, it's asking you to do a lot of something and trying to abuse some axis. But the Okos are just like, yeah, you just get too much from one card. It doesn't ask you for anything. Just cast it and you'll just get so much you'll reap so many rewards that on average you come out ahead expressive iteration was kind of like that although it, it did feed into some other stuff too like at a certain point you do have to say some of these cards are just giving you a little too much and they are also problematic so fable to me is like yeah like no it's not doing any one thing amazingly but the total amount you get is more than you should get from a card and I mean, I don't know. I just lose the fable all the time. Maybe you're beating it a lot more than I am. <laughs> well, you can play fable with any other color combination. So why is Rakdos the best one? Right? There, you could play a red green fable list. You could play a red white fable list. Like fable doesn't actually show up in that many lists. Why does it only show up in Rakdos? If if it's if it's so such a raw powerful card, why isn't fable in red blue lists? Why why isn't it in red white lists? Why isn't it red green lists? That, that's kind of what I'm saying is I, I'm agreeing Fable's a powerful card. Uh, maybe you think it's like an A plus and I think it's like, you know, an A or A minus. Um, but if Fable's just this raw, powerful card, you know, Oko used to just go in any deck that could play blue, green. You just find a way to play Oko, right? I'm, and again, we're not, I'm not, you can ban a card and it doesn't have to be as good as Oko. I'm just trying to think through that process. If, if Fable is a raw power card, isn't just, why aren't there all these red white lists um, that play for Fable and then other stuff? I think it's because Black has the, most efficient way of turning the mana that you have into trading for resources directly. Now that doesn't mean you can ban some of the black cards. Maybe Fable is the card that needs to go from there, but I, I just think it's worth, that's just a, a, a point worth noting. Well, in the current metagame, it's only in Rakdos, but it has done well in other decks before. I mean, it was a key card in Naya Winota before that deck got axed. It has been in some Is It decks. Yeah, it was definitely the reason that Winota had to get banned. That's, that's definitely true. Is It Creativity is somewhere in Frank Karsten's list of known decks and it's a four of there. So yeah, I mean, right now it's not in as many decks as it used to be, but it is still like the best of the three drops. Not every deck is interested in that. Anyway, food for thought. Yeah, I mean... To me, I think nothing should get banned because the format seems really balanced. When I look at the top eights of Modern and Pioneer, I don't see uh, one type of deck dominating. I don't see Rakdos midrange in half of the top eights. Um, so, you know, and same with, same with Modern. There are cards that I'd rather not play against, right? I'd, I'd rather not play against Friend and Six. It's ridiculous. I don't like playing against Omnath particularly. But... Um, when you look at modern top eights, you, you see like five or six archetypes every time. In Pioneer, you see four or five archetypes. I think we get a little ahead of ourselves if we think we can sculpt the format to be more balanced than that. It's been interesting to see that in modern, Archon creativity has just skyrocketed to the top of the metagame in the last month or so. Playing for Fable of the Mirror Breaker, just saying. It's a card that's too good for every format. Oh, do you want to ban Fable in Modern? Wait, do you want to ban Fable in Modern? All formats, just to be safe. <laughs> From now on, oh, it is the Oko. Fable is only legal <laughs> with the Magic 30th back. The proxy Fables you can have. <laughs> I think we should be talking about <laughs> unbanning cards in Modern and Pioneer. I, I think we should be trying to unban cards. How about unban Expressive Iteration? Say so the experiment, you know, we tried it. It was too harsh on the Izzet decks. Let's bring EI back and play in here. Aren't his index just still good? I just feel like people just are whiners. I think we should unban <laughs> Uro. Unban Uro. Unban, yeah, fine. Expressive iteration. Unban um Copter, of course. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just let's go to war here. Let's do it. I don't I don't understand. <laughs> okay. 
Fair enough. Unbanned pod in modern. Like, let's let's try it. Let's try it. It's not going to hurt anything. <laughs> I like that. But not twin because fuck twin. Not twin, but pod. Let's get Sam Pardee. Get a, he gets a 5-0 for a couple weeks. And he tells us how stupid we were to unban it. And then you can ban it again. It's okay. All right. We've reached an accord. So I think that's all the miscellaneous news. Maybe to close out, let's just talk about a little bit of actual decks that you can play if you want to play some modern and pioneer. There's been some cool tech floating around in the last few weeks. We haven't touched on all of it, so it might be nice to just take a look around at what's going on in the multiverse. What's been catching your eye, David? All right, so I want to talk about... I'll talk about Pioneer. I'll let you maybe highlight some cards in, uh, in Modern. So very famously, we Dan loves experimenting with cards that just like move cardboard around. And he's like, <laughs> Chronic Flooding does this unique effect that no other card does. And he built this Chronic Flooding list in 05, 010 and was like, this was terrible. I'm never playing this again. And then I couldn't believe it. Somebody, let's uh, give credit to the uh, creator, uh, Milk with two Ks. 5-0 with Chronic Flooding. What an amazing deck this is. Mono Blue, 4 Thassus Oracle main deck, 4 Jace Wielder of Mysteries main deck, 4 Treasure Cruise, 4 Temporal Trespass, 4 Chronic Flooding, 4 Founding of the Third Path. What, a, what an amazing deck. 5-0. Love it. Shocking deck. Absolutely shocking deck. So the mistake that I made, and I, I didn't really understand this until I looked at this deck and like some of the Titan's Nest decks from a couple months ago. When I put Chronic Flooding into the deck, I was correct that, okay, this moves so much cardboard into the graveyard. Yes, absolutely. What can I do with that? Well, well Uro was legal. You were trying to play with Uro, which was then legal. Is that correct? Okay. So I escaped Uro. It should be legal again. Hang on. It should be legal again. <laughs> exactly. So I can <laughs> rebuild the Chronic Flooding deck. <laughs> rebuild it, yeah. Using the Broken knowledge Chronic Flooding. Ban Flooding and uh, make Uro legal. So I had, like, I had part A correct, like I'm filling my graveyard, and then my part B was I'll escape Uro, stabilize, draw a card, whatever, and pass the turn. And that was my mistake. Like, that ended up not being strong enough. I just kept getting ranched by everyone. They just did more than me. But what, Mick, Milk, Meek, Mick? There's an L in there. That's Milk. Milk, sorry. But what Milk has figured out is you cannot pass the turn, right? Like, I was trying to figure out how this deck possibly wins. And it's got to be the Temporal Trespass, right? There's, there's no other way to win with the rest of these cards here. Yeah, so they're, they're tearing through their deck, and every Temporal Trespass, not only is it only costing three blue, it's also like generating mana if you think that every Chronic Flooding activation is making your next Temporal Trespass cheaper. Right, so you have four that you can draw, and you have four Founding of Third Path, which lets you rebuy ones that you milled. So you have, potentially, you, you can take all four time walks in the game. So you don't need that many turns, because when you look for the defense, there's not that much defense here. I mean, there's none. There's four Fading Hope. <laughs> I guess you can cast the Merfolk Seeker Keeper. You can cast the Thassa's Oracle. <laughs> yep, you can certainly cast Merfolk Seeker Keeper. That's a legal play you can make. I mean, that blocks... Blocks. Blocks a graveyard blocks, <laughs> Yeah, it blocks a, uh, a goblin token from your Fable of the, <laughs> the Mirror Breaker. I can't imagine this deck ever beating like a dedicated aggro deck, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe it actually can. And I'm sure that Temple of Trespass has something to do with that. It's interesting. So in my mind, I, I had the exact same thought you did, Dan. So I was like, oh, the sideboard has to be tweaked out to beat aggro. It's got to have a bunch of sweeper type cards or anything. Then I look, it's two Ashiok, <laughs> four <laughs> Mystic Dispute, two Malevolent Hermit. Three Master of Waves, okay, that at least blocks a little bit. And then four other gusts. So they are they don't even care about aggro. They're I am guessing the gusts are mostly there for mono green. Mm. Uh Master of Waves, I guess, is sort of against red black, but it's not very good against Rakdos or or Black X anything. Um so yeah, they just don't give a shit. <laughs> like, all right, you do what you do, man. There's not even like anti Thalia tech. I'm <laughs> just like, all right, resolve Thalia, I'll just pay one more for everything. It's go time. Brilliant deck building. Love it. Such a sweet deck. Question for you, David. Were we wrong about founding the third path? Because I'm seeing it a lot more than I would have expected. I like founding of the third path. I don't think it's that good, but it's the kind of card I would... If we had a founding of the third path week, I would have five decks to play with it, so... Hmm. Okay. Is it, is it modern playable? I haven't really seen it modern, but I think in Pioneer as a, as a two to four of... 
it seems pretty good to me. Seems bad to me, but I may be wrong about that. So, I think the mill, whatever the the middle ability to mill is actually quite relevant to like do all your stuff in one turn. Like, okay, they you discard two and your graveyard is exiled or or whatever. They've got a graveyard trespasser going. It like all of a sudden just turns on your crews without taking any mana. Right, so you like you cast on your turn, you you consider. Okay, you you cast a little more for your answer on your next turn. Okay, they they have a flipped uh, trespasser and they exile two cards, but you like mill a bunch and then you get to cast your T crews, and that's like enough against red black or whatever black graveyard hate. I mean, in this list, chapter one barely casts anything, so it's really got to be chapter <laughs> two and three. Yeah. I'm guessing it almost, you know, maybe it's just a tempo positive play if you cast it and get to cast Fading Hope. But then after that, yeah, it's just like the mill and, and everything else is, is what you're up, you're up for, I guess. All right, kudos to Milk on the sweetest 5 we've seen in a while. What else are you looking at? All right, I wanted to highlight some lists that are playing Treasure Cruise. I feel like we've lost the plot that Treasure Cruise is a card, the card we were talking about banning four weeks ago, and everyone couldn't believe Treasure Cruise wasn't being banned, and how could you only ban ex expressive iteration? We didn't like the reason for that. By we, I mean you idiots out there. Um, you've highlighted a super cool list from Hogpog98. Is that when they were born? These kids are also young. <laughs> well, that is uh, Arya Karamchandani. They are like in college, so I'd... They are pretty young. <laughs> okay, there you go. Hopefully graduating this year. Congratulations to Hogpog98. Adding white just to play a Monastery Mentor to their blue-red list. It's the only white card. Uh, love the idea because Monastery Mentor makes so many tokens that are really hard for um, removal-based decks to deal with. So if you make one or two tokens with your mentor in lists like this, where you're casting, you know, two to four spells a turn there, they're, those are actually threats as well. So if you think of a list like the black X decks that are casting lots of removal spells, it's really hard for them to actually deal with monastery mentor. They need to actually kick a push their damage based removal. So like um, stomp, you can control if that kills monastery mentor or not. And then you're making a creature that actually just like, trades with a full card from them right they're three two vampire they're whatever two two it's not gonna be able to profitably block a single token made from monastery mentor then the rest of your deck is just pure card advantage yeah i i love this this list no phoenix so you're n not as uh, vulnerable to graveyard hate you're just doing it with mentor and I, of course you have shredder just because it's so powerful um yeah super cool there's two copies of god's willing in the main deck like, that's dedication to the mentor cause. Oh, I missed that. Okay, so there's, there's six white cards. <laughs> I looked at this and I thought they were trying to just, like, almost as a joke, just swap out Arclight Phoenix for Monastery Mentor or swap out Thing in the Ice for Monastery Mentor or Crackling Drake. Like, the shell is a known shell, right? Your best is it spells for the Shredders and for the second creature of your choice. But to go into a third color just for Mentor, you, like, you have to really believe in Mentor. So I guess if you're going to do that, might as well play the God's Willing to back it up. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing that they are must have decided is we're not worried about taking the extra damage, right? Because that's basically all White says, is you're going to take a bunch of extra damage. Your mana's not going to be quite as good. But if you don't worry about that, especially if your turn one is going to be a tapped Rogren Triome, which they have four of, a uh, reasonable percentage of the time. The Monastery Mentor is much better than cards like Young Pyromancer or whatever. True. Um, the, the tokens it make are full-on trading. Like, they're having to trade their, you know, whatever, Graveyard Trespasser with the token that you make. They're having to trade their 2-2, two -two, uh, you know, Goblin that makes a treasure with the token you make. Yeah. And I, there was a time when, I think back when Is It Phoenix was king, some people were splashing into white just for sideboard monastery mentors. So it is like a thing that has some proof of concept behind it. But seeing it main deck, that's a surprise. Yeah, really, really interesting. I mean, I get a little uncomfortable playing that many coming to play tap lands, but you know, if if you know what you can what you're trying to beat <laughs> uh with that. Cause with only twenty lands, I feel like there's a no there's a 
large amount of time where you're on the draw against mono green and you have the shock to kill their elf, but you have to play a tap land instead. And then I think you're just playing from behind for the rest of the game. Huh. All right, one more deck that I think, again, is making really interesting use of Treasure Cruise is this quote-unquote Grixis list. There's no red cards other than Oracle Light Phoenix, though. Um, so the creatures, as you said, Dan, you're playing Ledger Shredder, we're playing Arclight Phoenix. They're playing three Shieldred, which is really cool with all of your draw. It means that your deck is like insulated against aggro in a way that you wouldn't expect. So you're, you're adding this quote-unquote third color. So you have a few red sources. So you're taking maybe a little bit more damage, but Shieldred's going to gain all that back for you. And like Shieldred with a T-Cruise in play, like it's really hard to lose those races, right? You're... It, Treasure Cruise helps you against them in the mid-range matchups. You're drawing three. That's a that's an effect that typical mid-range decks don't have. Shieldred gains six, so that's good against, you know, whatever, mono red or, or whatnot. Uh, and then it punishes in the mirror, you know, other opt um, considered decks. They don't typically play that many cards that actually kill Shieldred. So I just thought that was really cool tech. Again, we see the two copies of Fondi in the third path. Yeah, lots more stuff to cast here, though, right? You have Chart of Course, Power Word Kill, so you're actually getting your two mana back right away. Less, only one op, which is interesting. They're basically like replacing the ops with the founding the third paths. That can't be right. Hmm. Something seems off about that specifically, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's weird. Like, if you take Is It Phoenix and say, forget Red, I just want to play Demir Phoenix. We've seen that before, but... I mean, it, it's like it's a change to go from Fiery Impulse to Thought Seize, you know? Well, again, I think this gets to how much better the Black Removal is. Fatal Push and Blood, Chief's, Blood Chief's Thirst are so much better than the Red Spells at killing creatures efficiently. It, it's just really hard to deal with the fact that like Fatal Push is so much better than any other one-mana removal spell in the format. It's just not even close. So I, I think there's real benefits in playing Black. Also worth noting that Founding the third path, the mill here is relevant because you have so few ways to cast Arclight Phoenix. Milling it to your graveyard is, is quite powerful. Right. In this deck, there's not a ton of like discard outlets here. So if you draw an Arclight Phoenix, it's not going to be the best for you. You have Ledger Shredder, you have Charter Course. That's it. That's it. So don't draw your Phoenixes. You're founding the third path to cast Charter Course again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I believe that happens. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So anyway, I just want to remind people who are mad now, they want to ban uh, some red black. Let's get back on getting mad at banning Treasure Cruise. And then I'm, I'll be way ahead of you. We can talk about banning Mana Elf, you know, <laughs> six months when everyone catches up to where I'm at. <laughs> ban found me a third path. Yeah. Too good. <laughs> Before it's too late. <laughs> it's <laughs> Nip it in the bud. All right. And then just two quick spots here. I want to highlight this absolutely insane Golgari midrange list. So they're playing Gigantha. They're playing eight mana elves. Okay. I mean, we've, we've seen decks like this before. Their creature suite is four Graveyard Trespasser, four Lovestruck Beast. This is by S-Man 2.0. So that's already interesting. We don't see a lot of Lovestruck Beast anymore, right? That's a, that's a card that's pretty rare. So we're, we're, we're playing the eight mana elf, four Lovestruck Beast. That's interesting. We're splashing black to play Graveyard Trespasser. Again, we're playing Fatal Push because it's, you know, one of the best removal spells in the format. They're playing two all straight because they don't want to play any cards that trigger <laughs> Fatal Push, so it's not that good in their deck. <laughs> Abrupt Decay is the best two-man removal spell in the format by far. They're playing two Terror Sunder, which is an underrated removal spell. And then their Threat Suite is completed by four Stika's Chariot, which is super underrated, and four Sky, so four Sky Sovereign <laughs> Console Flagship. Now, I've been experimenting with two or three Sky Sovereign because I was just like, Red Blacklist, like, bring one in after board, and I've been, like, main decking. It's really powerful. Like, in my, like, blink deck, like, blinking at every turn, I realize it's just unbeatable. Like, Red Black just can't stop it. And Asika's Chariot is also insane against Red Black. So they just said, like, we're just going to win all the mid-range matchups with these <laughs> eight artifacts. They're just unstoppable. And then everything else has to beat everything else. I, it's just, I never thought of it before. I, I find this to be totally fascinating. No one else has 5-0'd with a list like this before. Uh... I, I, this is the kind of show at least I want to play around with. I just don't get it. I mean, you named the creatures first, eight elves, graveyard trespassers, lovestruck beasts. So you have one into three. Then you named a bunch of removal spells, almost all of them destroying creatures. 
there's no deck here, right? Like, where is there a deck? Where is there power? And the only cards that even suggest power are Asika's Chariot and Sky Sovereign. Are those really that powerful? Like, is, is Sky Sovereign just like this hidden card that people have just don't realize how insane it is? Well, like I said, I made that super janky uh, Bant uh, Blink deck, and I forewanded in 2-0 Red Black effortlessly, because my theory was if I was blinking a Seeker's Chariot every turn, I didn't have to cast another spell, and in, and in one game to test it, I just did not cast another spell once I established that. I just drew all my cards and just played lands. But this deck is not blinking these. You're only casting them once. No, I'm, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. My point is, the other card that that deck played was Sky Sovereign, so those, de- those cards match up very well with mid-range matchups specifically, but not anything else. Um, so I, I don't know. I've, I've never played a deck that has eight, <laughs> even in my deck that was ramping to artifacts that could cast them cheaper. I wasn't playing eight of those. Maybe. I mean, Sky Sovereign, I'm willing to believe if I can, uh, put my, uh, Mulder. Okay. Hat on. <laughs> sure. Four Mutavolts also. Yeah. Yeah. That. Anyway, absolutely wild list. And then the other one I wanted to highlight this is to sort of uh, support your point. You're a big uh, Fable guy, as we talked about. A lot of people have been playing Mono White Urian and then just splashing for four Fable uh, because the splash is sort of free, especially if you're playing four Knight of the White Orchid. And then they've also been playing four Karn. So, you know, the Cyborg gets weaker when you're playing Urian, but then your Cyborg actually you get more use out of because you're playing Karn. I think that's really interesting. This is a version that's splashing a second color just to play four Reflector Mage. Um, this is a list by Mavignon. Mm. Um, I had seen someone 5-0, I think the in the previous dump, they just splashed red just for Fable. But I think because you're playing these Triomes anyway, like the Rogren Triome, you know, I I I had pro- not proposed a list like this, but I had uh, argued with uh, Mord where I was playing a mostly white list with Knight. And it's like, as soon as you're playing Rogren Triome anyway to cycle, you might as well just splash the third color. <laughs> Because he, he was getting mad, I was always throwing that third color in there. But it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's a Orion list, whatever. So super cool. It's like all these value white creatures, including Sarah Paragon, and then four Karn. Your removals March and Portable Hole, which again aren't as good as Push, but they're fine. Then you play Fable to help you, you know, avoid the the flood or um, screw thing that happens a lot in these Orion lists. And in, in general, you're just a big mid range list, right? So I think the theory is you go a little bit bigger than other mid range lists. And these, uh, hopefully you draw enough of the uh, cheap removal against all the aggro. I just assume that the power of these decks came from Nykthos, but this deck cut the Nykthos. Yeah, so that's what really surprised me. The The first version, I think that this was probably based on, the whitelist that was just splashing Fable, had two or three Nykthos. This is playing zero. I don't know if that's because they're splashing the extra card. I would really want to get rid of the four Field of Ruins in this list, even though I know it's a fine card with Sarah Paragon, but the first Nykthos has to be better than the fourth Field of Ruin. That is 100% true. Yeah, give me, give me a Thalia's Lancers. Give me that legendary package. Okay, <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> then we can Thalia's Lancers for our main deck, Yorian. Do it all again. Get the Nykthos, then fetch the companion, Yorian. But this is a person who I, I like how they're thinking. They're like, let's just go a little bigger than the mid-range list. Again, that's how you beat other mid-range lists. But then what do you do against all the other cards in the format? And it, it seems like they're trying to find a way, you know, through all that. They're, they have a ton of removal in their creatures, four Reflector Mage, four Skyclave Apparition, four March of Otherworldly Light, four Portable Hole. That's all very efficient, plus three Wandering Emperor. And then it's just like, other than that, it's just a crazy value engine, right? So you're hoping that it gives you enough game against control, and it, it should, in theory... Uh, make you favored in, in the mid-range mirrors, which is in general what your Iron decks do, right? They they win the mid-range mirrors, and then <laughs> can they get enough out of their sideboard to help against the more polarizing matchups? And Karn, I think, is a really good card to add your your Iron list because it helps cover for the fact that your sideboard gets much worse when you're your Iron list. Yeah, excellent. All right, one last piece of tech that I'll end on. Dipping back to modern here, Orvar the All Form. So a few weeks ago, Mord got his, his dreams came true and somebody built a Micromancer control deck with Ephemerates and one, one mana spells. And a tutor for wizards, right? A, a wizard cycling card? Exactly. Step through which wizard cycles for two mana so you can play all your wizard one-ofs. 
And in our previous episode, uh, Anthony was a guest and they talked about Anthony's version of the deck and how you can tutor for Magus of the Tabernacle, Magus of the Moat, <laughs> Magus of the Moon, all your Maguses. But the card that Mord had in his, his Yorium build that like didn't totally make sense to me at first was Orvar the All Form. It's a changeling, right? It does a lot of weird stuff, but if an opponent causes you to discard it, you get to not put it into play, but you get to make a token copy of any permanent in play. A land or a permanent, you know, whatever. If they play Liliana, you can discard Orvar, get your own Liliana, if you want. Why does this matter? Well, I mentioned a while back that Archon creativity has just skyrocketed to the top of the modern metagame, and the secret is out now that Orvar the Allform is like amazing, amazing tech against Indomitable creativity. If they do it for one, you know, they'd get their Dwarven Mine, convert it to, to an Archon. You discard Orvar, you get an Archon trigger, they have to sack their Archon, and you get to start your turn with an Archon in play, and you basically just win the game from there. Even if they have creativity X equals two for two Archons, and you have one Orvar in hand, you still kill their Archons, because you just make sure that on the second trigger resolution you discard your Orvar, they lose one Archon, go to your turn, attack, they lose a the second Archon, it erases the creativity. It's, it's an amazing piece of tech. So it was not immediately clear if this was just going to be a meme or a joke, but, you know, I've been checking the, the news feed, refreshing Fire Shoes' feeds. This is where all the latest tech is being shared. And yeah, Young Dingo was playing a Rakdos Undying deck. Three Orvars in the sideboard. No intention of ever casting them, but three Orvars in the sideboard. <laughs> and said that, yeah, it, it just wrecked the two creativity opponents that he played against in his two leagues. He went nine and one. Yeah, super cool. I think he has one watery grave in his list. Ah, correction. Yeah, but that's probably more for the engineered explosives. And you just uh, as a uh, <laughs> confession time, I've played Orvar in Pioneer a bunch. I did not realize I could copy opponent's permanence. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have literally sent a screenshot to you, and no one corrected me, by the way. I'm not uh, impugning anyone else on the podcast, but I sent a picture of you guys like I was getting thought seized, and they had to take Orvar, and I just copied a land or something I didn't play. I have to go back and check if they had a permanent play I should have copied instead. <laughs> this was when it came out. Well, in Davis' defense, like, he, he built for the other part of Orvar, right? You, you were trying to actually like, get Orvar in play and then copy it with goblin dark dwellers and spike field hazard and stuff right oh yeah and then you just make five goblin dark dwellers i should rebuild that like it was sick orvar is a sweet card in multiple formats now yes and tutorable yeah, super with cool the tech. cycling deck cards <laughs> <laughs> so just watch out for that and you know if you if you want to complete your modern collection buy an orvar or two before they get expensive all right i think we will leave it there for now uh, we will be back on Friday with a new card to brew around for the week. I believe we are taking a look at the Haughty Gin, and we'll tell you a little bit about some of our testing as well. All right, sounds good. Take care, sir. Take care. Deck list for this episode can be viewed at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in on Friday for testing results with Tolarian Terror, plus new brews with Haughty Gin. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. 